Hi everyone, in this episode we're going to be adding mesh colliders to the generated meshes so that we can have a character walking along the terrain if we want. So let's head over to the endless terrain script and come down here to the terrain chunk class. And then here we've got the mesh renderer and mesh filter variables. Let's add in a third one, a mesh collider variable. And then here where we're adding those components to the mesh object we created, we can also uh, add the mesh collider component and assign that to our mesh collider variable just by saying mesh uh, object dot add component and adding a mesh collider component. All right, so then we just want to assign the mesh to the mesh collider when we receive it. So down here in the update terrain chunk class over here where we receive the mesh, we can just say mesh collider dot shed mesh is equal to the level of detail mesh. Okay, so let's quickly run this in Unity. And it's going to generate all of these. And if we just select one of them, we can see that it's got the mesh collider component added and the mesh has been assigned as well. Uh, one quick thing I'd like to do is just make it so that this preview mesh automatically hide it, hides itself when we enter play mode, so we don't have to do that manually. So I'm going to make a simple little script called hide on play. And that's just going to have one line in the start method saying game object dot set active false. Okay, and we can assign that to the preview mesh. All right, let's now import uh, one of Unity's standard characters so that we can test out our collisions. So let's go into Assets, Import Package. We're going to import the character package. Now, I don't want all of this stuff cluttering up our project, so let's be a little bit careful about what we import here. Don't want any of the editor stuff, and then uh, don't want any of the utility stuff or the cross-platform input. We might need some of these physics materials, I'm not sure. Uh, the characters, we don't need any of the audio, we don't need the guidelines. Let's just take the rigid body controller, we can remove the other one, which means that we don't need this script. And I'm not going to worry about the head bob script either. Certainly don't want rollerball, and I don't want the third person character. All right, so I think we've just got the stuff we want now, so we can import that. It's probably not going to work. You can see we've got an error here because uh, uh, it relied on some of that other stuff that we didn't import, but we can fix that uh, fairly easily. Let's just go on to the rigid body controller script and we'll remove this using cross-platform input line, which means that we're going to have to change all of these to the standard Unity input class. And there are a few more down here. Looks like we've got them all, and there are probably going to be a few in the mouse look script as well. Let's remove that using line and replace these. All right. Uh, in the rigid body first person controller script, I'm just going to find the update method. And let's also just add in an easy way to pause the game in the editor. So we can say if input dot get key down. Say if we press the escape key, then we're just going to pause the game by uh, saying debug dot break. All right. So that all seems happy now. Let's go to the prefabs folder and drag in a rigid body controller into our game. If we just go into the main camera here, we can see that the Head bob script obviously doesn't exist, so we can just remove that. And let's just apply the changes to the prefab. All right. So I'm going to put this at 000 in the world and just move it up a few units. And then let's try this out. So I'm going to drag the game window over here, set the aspect ratio to 16 by 9, and press play. Let's see what happens. So it takes a while for all the terrain to spawn in because of all of the colliders it's now having to calculate. But we can walk along the terrain, which is very exciting. You can also jump around. 
Uh, I'd like to be able to walk a little bit faster. So I'm just going to go into the movement settings here and give myself some superpowers. I'll say forward speed is 50 and maybe the jump force is say 150. All right. Uh, the terrain that's getting generated is also super massive. So perhaps we can just go into the endless terrain script and turn the uh, scale factor down a bit to maybe just two. Of course, this character is now the thing that's viewing the terrain. So we no longer really need this viewer object. Keep it around, I'll just disable it for now. But on the endless terrain script, we're going to want to set the rigid body controller as our new viewer object. And then just as a matter of interest, let's also bring up the profiler. I'll just dock that over here. And let me just make it a little bit bigger. And then let's press play. So we should be able to zoot around the terrain and uh, it should load in as we move around since this is now the new view object. You can see we had a little spike there um, just where the game froze for a moment. And that seems to be happening every now and again. I'm just gonna hit escape to pause and we can go along the profiler here. You can see these big orange spikes. If we just go over those, we can find out where those are coming from exactly. If we just drill down here, we can see it's coming from uh, mesh.bake physics collision data. And that's taking 340 milliseconds, which is obviously why we're seeing these spikes where the game freezes. So the only way we can really uh, tone that down is by not generating so many colliders at once and also by reducing the number of vertices in each of the colliders that we create. So let's say that we're only going to add a collider to the mesh when the player is actually quite close to it. And we're also not going to use the full resolution mesh for the collision mesh. Uh, we'll use one of the lower uh, levels of detail for that. So in the endless terrain script, let's come down here to our level of detail info struct and we're going to add a public pool to this called use for collider. All right. So then uh, over here in the inspector, we can choose which of the level of details will actually have its mesh used for collisions. So I'll use the second level of detail here. We'll probably want it to be a little bit more detailed than level of detail four, because that's going to result in very inaccurate collisions, it'll probably be extremely noticeable. I'll change that to one, which is just one lower than uh, our highest level of detail. And just so that there's not so much discrepancy between this and the next level of detail, maybe turn this down to four. And I'm also just going to decrease these ranges here. I think it's a bit excessive, so this will be visible within 100 units. This may be 250 units, and this can be 400 units. All right, so now in the constructor here, where we're creating all of the level of detail meshes, we're going to want to store a special reference to the one that is going to be used for our collisions. So up here, let's create a level of detail mesh variable called the collision level of detail mesh. And then in this loop, we can say if detail levels i dot use for collider, then the level of detail mesh that we've just created is the collision mesh. So we can say collision level of detail mesh is equal to level of detail meshes i. All right. So now in the update terrain chunk method, we no longer want to assign any old mesh. So we'll remove that line. And instead, outside of this whole uh, if statement here, we're going to say only if the level of detail index is equal to zero. So only if the player is close enough for the terrain to be being rendered at its highest resolution, are we going to bother adding any collisions? So if that's the case, then we're going to check if our uh, collisions level of detail mesh actually has a mesh. 
And if it does, then we can simply set mesh collider dot shared mesh equal to our collision level of detail mesh dot mesh. Otherwise, we're going to check if the collision level of detail mesh uh, has had its mesh requested. So we'll say if not collision level of detail mesh dot has requested mesh. So if we haven't yet requested the collision mesh, then obviously now's a good time to do it. So we can say collision level of detail mesh dot request mesh and pass in the map data. Okay, let's save that. And let's press play. So if we just uh, pause quickly and go here, uh, we can see that only the highest level of detail terrain chunks have got the uh, mesh collider mesh assigned. If we look at these, there is no mesh assigned to the mesh collider component. And we should also see that the mesh uh, being used for rendering, you can see it's got 57,000 vertices, whereas the mesh being used for the mesh collider has only got 14,000 vertices. So let's play this again. And if we just stroll around a bit, we should see that it is running a lot more smoothly than it was previously. We are still getting these spikes. Uh, unfortunately, that can't be entirely avoided. It's still the physics baking the collision data, but it's down to around 60 milliseconds where it was 340 previously. So the only way we're really going to improve on that time is by decreasing even more the number of vertices in the collision mesh. And we can look at some advanced ways to do that later on, but for now we're just going to be content with 60 milliseconds. Um, what I am interested in though are these blue spikes over, over here and over here, which represent our scripts. So if we just have a look here, you can see it's taking 36 milliseconds for the map generator to update, but unfortunately we don't have enough information to tell us exactly what is taking so long in the update. So I'm going to quickly turn on Deep Profile, which usually makes things run quite slowly, but it will give us the information we need. So let's move around a little bit. And here we're getting some of those spikes, so let's pause. And let's try find out exactly what's causing that. So this is 301 milliseconds here. We can open that up. 301, open it up. So it seems to be coming from the mesh data dot create mesh. And the majority of that is from the calculate normals method. So we now know what the culprit is. We can turn off deep profile and let's head over to our mesh generator script. Down here at the bottom, we're calling calculate normals, which is a method that we created last episode. So what we can do is, if you recall, create mesh is being called from the main game thread. However, the rest of this, the generate terrain mesh method is being called from a separate thread. So what would be great is if we could move the calculation of the normals onto the separate thread instead of having it run on the main game thread. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a vector three array called our baked normals. And then down at the bottom here, we can have a public method, bake normals. And it's simply going to say bake normals is equal to calculate normals. And then when we call create mesh, we'll just set mesh.normals equal to the normals that we have baked. And then this method is going to be called uh, at the end of the generate terrain mesh method, just over here, mesh data dot bake normals. That way it's being run on a separate thread. So if we play this one more time, we should see that once again, the performance has increased slightly. So we're making some progress. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.